tonight, uh, I get to interview someone else who's very, very remarkable and somebody who I've wanted to interview for a while. So <laughs> thank you for, uh, for allowing me to. Ladies and gentlemen, I have Terry McBride with me. Now, yeah, please. I, how I do my interviews is an inquiry through curiosity. I met with Terry a few weeks ago, and uh, we sat in his offices, which are very, a very cool place, and we'll talk more about that through our conversation about uh, interesting workplaces and environments. But I, I got to do an inquiry about his life and talk a little bit, uh, uh, you know, kind of person to person, entrepreneur to entrepreneur, about, about things that I wanted to know about him. And we're going to go through that inquiry again today, and it can go many different ways. That's why I don't over prepare any questions. We just have a conversation, and at the very end, I open it up to the audience to speak to Terry as well. So let's begin. Dialogue. After you. Yeah. Um, tell me about where you grew up and, uh, and sort of the environment that you grew up in. I grew up in, in Richmond. Uh, stayed there till I was about 17. Uh, a bit of a middle class family. You know, father was a professor at UBC. Mom was a uh, stay at home mom. She went to UBC for one year to, to meet a husband. She scored, <laughs> came home. Sounds familiar, right? You know, they bought a house in Richmond. Um, and that was my life growing up. It was rather plain, rather vanilla. And er early on, did you have uh, any, any jobs that you had early on in your life? Oh, God. Yeah. We talked about this. Yeah. I did everything from um, lifeguarding, which was the best paid job, to delivering pizza, to working a midnight shift at a uh, fish farm. Um, just, I did a whole, it's just anything. Yeah. I DJed a lot. Yeah. You know, I did Music. weddings. Yeah. yeah. Now, weddings. Don't, never do weddings. <laughs> I learned that as a videographer. Right? They suck your soul. They're, <laughs> they're beautiful for those that are there, but from a musical sense of view. Uh, school. School. Yeah, where did you go to school after high school? Or did you? I went to UBC for four years. Yeah. Um, then I took a sabbatical. I was a civil engineer. Um, I was 21 years old, and I faced probably my first really big life decision. Um, my sort of sport of choice and my sort of my you know passions were all coming together and you know at once um, I was a you know field hockey player I played on the Canadian national on the Canadian national team um, that's what that's what happens when you grow up in Richmond yeah. it's a sport of choice at that time and um, you know I had to decide whether I was going to stay with the national team or if I was going to keep doing the civil engineering which you know anyone who's been an engineer it is it is crushing when you get to your third and fourth year. Yeah. Um, it's crushing if you don't get in and you have Indian parents as well. So, uh, different story altogether. <laughs> and whether I wanted to follow my actual passion, which was music. So, um, probably the most acceptable pill to my academic father was to take a sabbatical. Um, I had no interest in going back. Back then, um, to become an architect, you had the six years and then you had at least two or three more more years on top of that before they let you touch things and design things and build things and I didn't want to be a glorified drafts person I wanted to actually create yeah. so the creation was going to be in the music I didn't know how but it didn't really matter that's just kind of what I did give me a frame line what what year are we at right now when you start when when you started to look at this music idea here 21 so I'm 54 years now Wow. 34 wow. years ago Wow. Now, what was the music scene at that time that influenced you? Um, probably the music scene that influenced me the most was the music coming from England and from Europe, which did not get commercial airplay with Inside Vancouver. And back then, there was no such thing as the internet. You couldn't go find it. You couldn't go steal it. You actually had to go buy it. So when you're paying quite big prices for a piece of vinyl, I don't know if any of you know vinyl, you know, um, it's that round the stuff with the hole in the middle yeah. um, that's actually making a comeback. Yeah. Um, it's now 5% of the marketplace. Wow. For a while it was zero. Um, wow. But, you know, that, that was a big purchase, so you had to be very sure that you were going to buy that music. And I had quite the music collection, which then allowed me to... Um, the wedding music was music that I d yeah. didn't necessarily love. Yeah. And then there was the music that I loved. So the sure. DJ stuff that I loved to do was at the nightclubs, and I've, I, I, were any of you around when like Love Affair was the like place to be? Okay. Fake ID. I was one of those DJs spinning at the Love Affair. Wow. So that's where I got to express 
that sort of new that sort of new music. What what was um, what was the starting point for Network? I, first of all, I, I, you know, I never asked you this uh, in our previous. How did you come up with the name Network as well? The spelling of it too. Interesting. Well, yeah. initially we had a uh, Mark and I formed a company called Noetics. Um, it lasted about eighteen months. It was an absolute disaster, and we went bankrupt. That was my, you know, first taste of the music business. Um, moved moved down to San Francisco for about a year. Slept on couches. At a certain point, got back in my, you know, Volkswagen Beetle and barely got to the Canadian border before the car died. And you know, came back and had to move into my parents with my, you know, tail between my legs for about a year. That's how Mick Jagger started, by the way. No, I'm joking. Um, so yeah, I mean, so that didn't work. Um, Network was a playoff noetics. But network. you need to go back 30 years. And, and the, the concept of a network, if you say to anybody now you, you have a network of systems, everybody knows exactly what you're talking about. 30 years ago, the word network wasn't used. It was in the dictionary, but it wasn't used. It, it's, it's not the, the sort of common thing it is now. Like, people were like, network? Like, what's a network? Like, it was unreal. So we decided to spell it the German way, based on this band called Kraftwerk. So we just kind of changed it up, and one of the smartest things we ever did is we went and we trademarked it. Because now there's, you know, everyone tries to do a, you know, funny twist off internet or network or some of this. It was great to have that sort of done. And back then, there was no other networks. So it wasn't really an issue. That's pretty amazing. Who are your first artists? Who did you sign on? Why did you sign them on? First artists yeah. were, there was uh, three artists. There was uh, Grapes of Wrath. There was this, who were this folk rock band from Kelowna. They ended up having one hit, All the, All the Things I Wasn't, which was a great song. Um, this grunge, theatrical, kiss-like electronic band called Skinny Puppy which in Germany was massive. Germany, Chicago, and Florida. Figure that one out. Massive. I mean, massive to the point of playing to 10, 15,000 people. But, you know, they could walk into Rogers Arena here and sell it out. That's how massive it was. Um, and then an electronic pop band called Mauve. Wow. So our thought was, don't start with one, but start with three. Make a statement right out of the box about what the label brand was, not the individual artists. Mm -hmm. They have their own brands and their own sounds, yeah. but the brand of the actual label. Wow. So from the initial thought process was, how do we make this look like it's something really different? Yeah. It's not commercial. It has a sense of design, a sense of style right out of the box. Wow. What, what do you think the process was for you to, you, you were touring these people, not across, not across Canada, but you would, you would tour, how, how would you tour them? Where would well, you put them? Yeah, where was the music going? Initially, these bands didn't tour. At all. So it was nice that we paid for studio time and we created these great songs and we wanted to sell these songs, but then the bands couldn't get off their asses. <laughs> so we found ourselves booking concerts and booking tours and a couple years later we, we realized that's what artist managers do. So we started an artist management part of Network. So there was the record label and then there was the management part of, of like Network. Now where was money being made? How was, how was? Nowhere. Nowhere. Okay, so let's talk about that. Let's talk about the business of, 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 yeah. Money was being made in all of the other jobs that Mark and I worked. So talk about that. So you're multitasking. You're not just. Mark, who was my founding uh, partner in, in Light like, like, like Network. And Network's had the same four members for the better part of the last 25 years. So, which I think is a real testament to any sort of partnership to have it for that long. And actually still like the people that you work with. And actually still want to go on fishing trips with them or things of that nature, right? You know, um, so that's, that's precious and something that, 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 that you should really think about when you actually build, you know, companies. Loyal, 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 loyalty is a really interesting quagmire. So I, during the record company part of it, you'd get up early, you'd work in the morning. Yeah. i go to my, my day job, which was to work at a record store. i come home during lunch. I'd work on the record company. Remember. We didn't have smart devices. Everything was a typewriter or something called a, um, even like fax machines didn't exist then. You know, and a lot of it was just phone. And phone was really expensive then. Okay, so you wrote a lot of letters and you posted them in something called Canada Post. <laughs> so, and then you'd come home at night and we'd do the same, you'd work till midnight and you just do the same thing again. And this was seven days a week. 
You know, um, we used to put together the you know cassettes. Um, I don't know. Does anybody know what a cassette is? Yes. Okay. So we, we'd actually have the printed parts. We'd have the plastic shells, and we'd have the actual you know music on the mag on the magnetic tape. And we'd we would every weekend we would get some cheap wine because that's all that we could afford. And um, everyone would come over and drink the wine and put the cassettes together. Wow. And that was our manufacturing line. Uh, I mean, the, the, the wall between my, uh, my apartment and where the business was in my apartment was a wall of vinyl. And the great thing about vinyl, it's kind of like, it's kind of like Lego. You can stack it up, right? So my bedroom was separated from the office by a wall of vinyl, basically a bunch of boxes. Yeah. That's kind of what it was. But that's what you needed to do. Where was the transition point from where you weren't sleeping in a room where there's vinyl in between your walls and you're making <laughs> some money? Quite a long time. And, how, and, how, and, and what was that? Was, it, was, it, was there a group of artists? Was it timing? What, what, what happened that was the transition point? I would say it was about approximately 10 years in. Yeah. Um, we had built up a large enough catalog. Sure. And some of it was actually selling. Yeah that I could afford to move upstairs from the office that was downstairs, but still in the same building. Wow. Um, and it wasn't really till probably about, I'd say, uh, I'm going to say about 98, 99, wow. that there was like success on a scale that I would never have imagined. Yeah. But previous to that, it was, it was, it was tight. It was hand in mouth. Where, where are you? Where is? Where are you as an entrepreneur, saying that I need to stick with this? When, when it, I mean, that we're talking about. You started in the mid '80s, yep. going up to '98. That's a long period, yep. and for some people, uh, you know, they'd be like, "Okay, we had a really good go after 10 years, <laughs> 15 years. Now, now you're going into it a little bit longer. What made you stay and kept, keep doing it? It's what I loved. Awesome. So I had, I had, I'll, I'll call it passion blinders. This is what I knew. This is what I wanted to um, do. I could see what was going to happen. Yeah. Um, and I think one, one of the hardest things for any entrepreneur to have is patience. Yeah. So it's positive thinking. It's understanding and knowing exactly where you're going. Where's Network today? Offices in New York, Boston, LA, London, Hamburg, and Vancouver, and um, a phenomenally successful company. How many artists do you guys have? How many? What catalogs um, do you guys I'd, I'd say the current roster is about 30 to 40 artists approximately. Yeah. On the label side, maybe about um, 15, 20 on the management side, and a, a bit bigger on the publishing side because yeah. publishers don't have to work as hard. Yeah. So probably about 60 or 70 writers or, or artists in, in like some form. When, when you meet people in social settings, do they come up to you and they're like trying to pitch you, like just give you a tape, CD, start singing in front of you? Like what? What? Like I, I can imagine. I, just, you know. I had. I had. We uh, had. What's the string? I want to hear the crazy rock star stories here. That's what I want, Terry. So, you know. Um, they no longer give me tapes. Okay. Sorry, yeah, just. Yeah, that's right. Sorry. Yeah. Um, they don't give me vinyl. They don't give me vinyl. No, that that might be cool. Actually. That would be cool. Yeah. Um, I try not to accept C sure. um, CDs. Just send me an email with a with a with a URL to some cloud based link. And that way, it's very easy for me to listen. Yeah. If, if you make it hard for me to listen, chances are I won't get to it. Yes. So you make it really, really easy, then it's very easy for me to listen. Um, we've had people sing opera yeah. in front of our office to show how talented they are. Sure. This, this one girl sat there for a whole week, sang every day. You know, she did it first thing in the morning, she did it at, you know, and then again at lunch, hoping that, you know, I'd walk out the door and hear her. What she didn't realize is I wasn't there. Oh. Yeah. Wow. You know, um, but you know, artists get really, really creative. Yeah. They'll like, you know, send you all, all like sorts of stuff to sort of buddy up. Yeah. Are you part of what? What part of the process are you involved with? Like, I guess when you start a label, you get you have to do everything. Yeah. But what? Do you, what is your favorite part of this business? Um, for me, it's 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 using my intuition to sign artists that I love. Yeah. And I've learned to take the like and the make money aspect out of that equation. Yeah. Because whenever we've done something to make money, we've always lost money. Yes. Whenever we've done stuff because we like it, we've lost money. Yes. Whenever we've done stuff that we love that might make n no sense to anyone else, it's been successful. <laughs> might take time, but it's been successful. 
you know, whether it's a little, you know, bluegrass song like, you know, Wagon Wheel. Mm -hmm. You know, pretty much everyone's heard of Wagon Wheel now if you've been listening to The Voice, you know, last, you know, last season. But it's a little band from Nashville, Tennessee. That song has sold one and a half million copies. It took 15 years, but that's what it's ended up doing. And when we signed the artist, it, most of the people who worked at the company looked at me like, what are we supposed to do with this? Yeah. And, and I'm like, it's amazing. Let's figure out what to do with it. Yeah. I remember in our conversations we talked about um, the whole piracy aspect. Yep. And how did that affect your record label when you guys started, or when that started? Well, I mean, you think piracy started in about 99. So just as we were getting <laughs> yeah. to our scale and getting a name and getting success, along comes piracy. <laughs> um, but, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of interesting because uh, initially you're like, you know, F you, how dare you steal our intellectual property, I'm going to sue the bejesus out of you. That's, that's the initial reaction. And then you kind of sit back and go, well, how, how are you going to sue a bunch of teenagers? You, you can't tell a teenager what to do. And a lawyer certainly is not going to change a teenager's behavior. Um, and their parents certainly are going to try, but they will fail. So it, it, it came down to, what's the opportunity? And the opportunity was the future, really. And um, so Network around about 2007, 2008 um, made a profound shift within our actual business model and the way that we approached every, you know, everything. At, at that point, probably about 95% of the marketplace was still physical. 5% um, was digital. So if I fast forward to today, network's about 80, 70 to 80% digital. The rest of the marketplace is just tipping over 50% now. The great thing about digital is you have a great margin. I, I, I don't have to make something. I don't have to ship something. I don't have to buy shelf space somewhere to actually sell it, and I don't have to accept half of it back. So it's, and it's an amazing opportunity. But the, the whole epiphany that, that led to this shift had nothing to do with the sort of the, tech, the technology part of it. It had nothing to do with that. It had to do with understanding what's a song. The lawyers see a song as a copyright. Try and explain that to a kid. Okay, copyright, the whole concept of copyright. Musicians see it as lyrics, melody, um, choruses, verses, chords. Um, I don't see it like the lawyers see it, and I don't see it like the musicians see it. A song is an emotion. It's a motive. And a song becomes popular if you yourself attach your own emotions to that song. And when you do that, it becomes a bookmark with inside your life. Not the million other people that might have bought that song. It's your life. So you could sell a million copies, like Coldplay's Yellow. You could sell a million copies of that song. Every single person has a different emotional connection to it. How can you sue someone for sharing their emotions with their friends? And that's what the lawyers and the business didn't understand. We're in the emotions business. We monetize emotions. And that, uh, that epiphany was literally, oh, OK, what's the first thing that I can do? So the first thing that we did is we defended a family in Dallas against the RIAA, which is the industry organization that was suing all these people. So we were the first company to step, we, were a, we are a member and still are. We, we stepped away and went, suing our customer is not good for our business, duh. But we need to stop this. Because the only way that we're going to actually win is actually to create something that is emotionally engaging with our audience. And it was the engaging part that they hadn't got. And it was the piracy that they were trying to fight. I mean, I don't get piracy because you download all this crap on your, on your storage device and you hope it works, you hope it doesn't have viruses. You know it's not right. Um, and that was the whole piracy business. So the whole thing was, how can we create something better? How can we create something that doesn't have a hassle factor to it? If we can make something better than piracy, to make piracy look like it's a hassle, the business wins.
That's the opportunity because it's about emotions. It's not about copyrights, it's not about lyrics, and it's not about music. It's about emotions. And if we win that battle, we have an amazing business that's incredibly scalable. And that was, that was the whole shift in the sort of business model. Yeah. So it's interesting when I, when I was speaking to Terry when I met him in his office, um, I, I'm learning a lot right now of he's, he's a very early adopter of, of thinking the way things are thinking, even when people aren't thinking about them, just for, from the name network. But you wrote an article, The Millennials, Meet the Millennials. Yeah. I want to talk a bit about that article yeah. and then the, the forethought. And, and about, give a context to the year and what this was about, yeah. Um, I wrote it in 2007, published in 2008. It was published by a, a British uni, you know, university, and it was about the millennial generation. Back then, and you know, now it's a very common word. Back then it wasn't a very common word. Um, but it was about what the future was for the music business or the emotive business. And, of course, the minute that you write these things, about 30% of what you wrote is outdated the minute that you write it, which is, which is brilliant. Um, and it was probably one of the hardest things I've ever had to write because sure. I had to work with an editor yeah. who would take all of this stuff that I was blue skying and, and try and cut it down so that people could actually understand what the hell I was talking about. Yeah. So I m we must have rewritten that thing 20 times over. Yeah. It wasn't worth the fee. I was, I was, I was like, like paid. Master's experience, actually. but it was, it was great in that you know, for me, I hypothesized that a game changer would be something called a digital valet. So something where you could tell a you know smart device, um, I have my grandma's um, 50th wedding anniversary next week. I need to create a playlist. I need to create the music for the party. Um, I'm the kid who's pirated all of these songs, so I, I must have something that's relevant to grandma 50 years ago getting like, married. Okay, that's, to create that playlist is probably going to take three, four hours and a lot of hassle because you don't know what was popular then, and it's definitely not the music that you like. Well, a digital valet, you would say, can I have the, the top 20 songs from two years before and two years afterwards, and obviously, you know, you know that year. It would, which would instantly pull you a playlist of 100 songs, would take you all of about 15 seconds, and you're the hero of the party because you got all of the hits from that time for Grandma. Pirating was the hassle. The digital valet was the value equation to the, to the sort of emotional equation here. Um, now we have Spotify, we have RDO, we have Pandora, we have all of these digital valets that started coming out, I think, 2009, 2010. Wow. You should get so, a retro check on that. <laughs> you know what? To me, it, it was about, please give us something that's better than piracy. And what's absolutely brilliant in you know, Sweden 10, 12 years ago was where Pirate Bay started. Probably the biggest pirate site in the world yeah. in its heyday. Sweden right now has about 1% piracy. These digital valets dominate over 90% of the marketplace. Piracy has evaporated. We are still suing people in North America. <sighs> you know, when are we going to learn? Head office, Vancouver, for network? It's only the head office because the four owners really love living here. Sure. But for the better part, it's back-end administration. Yeah. Because all of the marketing and promotional talent really is New York, London, yeah. LA. Nice. And whenever you're in Europe now and you see these trends that are happening or have been happening for a longer period of time, are you bringing back new ideas? What's 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 next in music? That's what I really want to ask you. Like, you know, what's next for your well, industry? To me, I mean, the I, the last shift is that everything. North America is still about a purchase mentality. We, we, we still buy music. Um, the last shift will be accessing music, using the digital val uh, valets to access music. Um, we won't buy any music. I mean, why do you want to buy music when you have access to 30 million songs floating in the like, clouds? What you need is something to go get the ones that, that you want to hear, not all the garbage that you don't want to hear. Okay. So um, that's the last shift that the music business still has to go through. Yes. I mean, you know, here in North America, iTunes 
Apple is still the big player. They're about 40% of the marketplace. In Sweden, they're 2% of the marketplace. Streaming services are 90% of the marketplace. Streaming services in North America are still only 10, 15% of the marketplace. You know where it's going. It's all going to be access stream based. We're in a we're in a performance mentality, which is awesome. Who are some some of your favorite artists? Our own artists or other artists? Artists. Artists. You name them. Um, one of my favorites right now is an artist named Passenger, okay. which is signed to Network. Yeah. Um, a song called Let Let Her Go has become a worldwide smash. Um, it's been a marathon. Sure. But he's such an amazing person and such a humble guy. Yeah. This is someone who's been busking for a decade. Wow. Busking. Yeah. You know, and the he, he was on the Today Show today, and they were, like, stunned. Like, so two years ago, you were busking. Yep, I was busking. That's how I made my money to eat. Do you have touch points with all your artists? Do you get to meet all of them, or are they, are they all over, the, uh, like, you know, the world? They're, yeah. they're all over the world, but they're still touch points. Yeah. yeah. You know, I kind of stay out of the machine part of it yeah. and just keep what I can what I consider to be very authentic to what they are which is to talk about the music and the power of that music and how that music is changing people's lives in a in like a better way yeah and um, I mean you know the it, it was it was interesting the the business people talk about the Budweiser ad that used the want that 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 used the passenger song as you know, 48 million views. It was viewed on the Super Bowl. They picked the best ad period. That's how the business people talk about it. Mike and I talk about well. Last year, Fleetwood Mac's "Landslide" was used in that ad. Isn't it amazing that your song was used after such an iconic song? That's cool. Yeah. It's a completely different conversation. One's about horses and puppies and selling beer and branding and, and other ones about music. So mine are about music when I talk with the artists. The rest of the stuff is, let's go. You know, it's like, what an amazing way to let people hear this song. You get a minute on national TV to 120 million people, no one's talking over it. And that's, was the, that was the marriage of the emotional of the song with a visual. When those two come together, you have magic. Yeah. You have magic. That's better than hearing it on the on the like radio. When there's an emotional scene attached to a to a lyric, it impacts you in a, in a way that you n don't necessarily comprehend. It sticks. I go through that experience too. I, I don't know if you all watch music videos or seen something. You know, my parents watch Hindi videos or they watch uh, we watch English ones. And and when I see see a song that I like or I recognize and I see the video. I will tend to listen or download or, or buy that music, and I, I will remember that more. It's actually fine to pirate it. It's yeah. okay. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I almost caught myself. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm not the one to sue you. No, I appreciate that. And we're on camera, so it's all good. Um, <laughs> my own camera. Uh, I. You realize I haven't. I, I have not signed a release. For I, this. Know, <laughs> I know. I know. I know. Well, we'll talk about. It. I'll be. I'll be singing in front of your offices next week. I. I have to say that there's something very interesting, again, um, about uh, the whole feel of being in the West Coast, uh, being in a happy business like music, mm -hmm. um, and the business side, and understanding all the intricacies of it, and then yoga, because I want to talk about why yoga, your next big adventure that's very successful, and I've been in your studios, uh, one or two of them, and uh, there's something right about, about the way that you've uh, created this atmosphere, so I want to talk about how did, uh, now, now, we had a conversation about how it happened, but really, how did, how did Y-Yoga, what, what was the need for this, this amazing uh, business? Purely selfish. Yeah, talk about that. <laughs> Purely selfish. Um, I'd fallen in love with yoga. I'd come out of a long-term relationship. Um, needed to do something different. Um, I was an avid, you know, runner, tennis player, played tennis every, every morning. Um, the girls at the office took me to a yoga class. The most humbling, event of my life. I realized that I was in a completely different shape and maybe it was the wrong shape. So I was killing my body, pounding it into the ground and doing nothing to actually heal it and make it like stronger and actually better. So that was great. The problem is, you know what, um, clean, or changing in a closet, not my idea of what I want to do. 
Um, I go to some other studios. If, I, if you were lucky enough to have a shower, it was a gang shower. That was maybe high school for me. So it became like, except when I went to Hong Kong, I could not find a yoga studio that I would be a member of, that I'd pay to be a member of. And I went, hang on, it's, this, is, this is crazy. It's really good for you. It becomes addictive because obviously if you feel good after you do something, it releases endorphins. Those are addictive, whether you get it through yoga, whether you get it through other ways. It's addictive. And I went, OK, um, there's lots of people like me whose bodies have been pounded into the earth, who have very sore lower backs, who make a, a great scalable business model for chiropractors that could actually do with um, something, a, a, a type of physical activity that would make them healthier, would slow them down, would give them the same high that a, that a runner gets, or that you get when you're in a, when you're in a, a zone playing any type of sports. You get in that zone, it's like nothing else exists except what is in front of you. That's the closest that sports people get to meditation. It's that singularity. It's so similar. So, but there's no place to go. Best thing to do is to build one. Um, I had forgotten how hard it was to start a business. At that point, I had lots of success. I had forgotten how hard it was to build a business from scratch. Wow. And yes, it's doing great. Yes, it is. But yeah. there was a very tall mountain to climb. What, did, what was the And there's still a hell of many, many more mountains yeah. to climb. How many, how many studios do you have right now? Uh, nine in the Lower Mainland and one in Toronto. What was number one like to build that and get it done to the way that you wanted it and then having people receive that same feeling that you that you needed? It was on the North Shore. It cost way too much money. Yeah. Uh, we tried to fit everything into it. Um, now it's our most successful studio, but it, it, was, it was beautiful. Um, but within a month of it opening, I remember going back and going, what would I change? It wasn't what would I change, so what would I take out? How can I make this simpler? How can I make the process simpler? How can we design for how people actually use it? I mean, it's, 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 it's kind of amazing if you watch even, if you watch the evolution of any beautiful design, it evolves based on how it's used, not on, not on how the engineers designed it. If you look at the initial you know, um, iPhones or like iPads, it, it wasn't really about the technology. It was, about, it was about what people were gonna do with it. Like the iPhone never took off till the App Store hit. Because the App Store tapped the imagination of millions of people to use this piece of engineering to create their vision of what it was. So it, it, it's very interesting. Every time we open up a yoga studio, we think it's the best thing in the world. And three months later, we're like, okay, we gotta change this, we gotta change that. And it's, it happens every, happens every time, which is awesome. Yeah. But the hardest thing to get to is simple. Yeah. It's the hardest thing to get to. I'll spend my whole life getting to the word simple. And I'm not sure I'll get there. Wow. When you, when you first thought of, did you think of this as gonna be a full-time venture or no. a main venture? Absolutely not. Business-wise, because you were in the music business. Yep. You are in the music business. But, but yoga and music are the same thing. Interesting. They're thousands of years old, yeah. and they both deal with emotions. Yeah. And I'll tell you, um, a rock star yoga teacher is no different than a rock star. They have the same dramas, the same emotional mess ups. There's a reason why they're doing yoga. <laughs> so that was the uh, it's hot that was sweaty. that was the most interesting part. I thought I thought these people would actually have their emotional act together. <laughs> Farthest thing from it. Okay. I know they know they're very different animals, yoga and music. But which one was harder to build, or which is harder to build? Not sure yet. Yeah. Music's been going for thirty years. Yoga's been going for six. Wow. You need to ask me that. And um, what we it took. Join us again in we 20 need years, guys. Nine, uh, nine more years. Okay, nine, nine more nine years? Nine years. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I might nine have more hair, maybe depending on technology. <laughs> um, you can always green screen always, you. Yeah, I've, I've tried that, believe me. I'm a video editor. Um, 
what I'm what I'm hearing right now, and it's very interesting to me, is that you are not just a business person because I think the business is a bystander of of what you actually are. You're passionate. You're, mm -hmm. You've you've chased and are accomplishing in businesses that are not easy. First of all, uh, you know, the music business is. It's not. I think a lot of people have tried it, and you've, you're a success story from it, from from a, d a very public standpoint. But talk about passion, being passionate about your work. It's pretty interesting to me. I think if you're not passionate about something, you don't love it. Go find something you are passionate about, and that you and like that you you know do love. Otherwise, you'll always be second guessing yourself for the rest of your life. Yeah. And it, it and again, it doesn't have to be anything that 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 like changes the world. It's it's what resonates with you. Being an entrepreneur is purely selfish, but it's selfish to be selfless. Because yeah. if you create something that changes other people's lives, you've made this world a better place. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, the why yoga thing, it was selfish to be selfless. I knew that there was millions of me. And if I built something that I loved, that I was passionate about, that would help me get healthy, that all we needed to do was market it, promote it, and people would come. And of course, give a, you know, on the sort of business sense, give a long enough runway of losing cash for them to come. So I, I mean, it's 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 it is it's it's what you love. It's what you understand. It's it's purely intuitive. Mm -hmm. And there's no difference for me between music and and like and like yoga. Actually, the the the, the, the sort of optical illusion is kind of hilarious to me. They're they're really just mirror images. How do you divide your time on how you pay attention to business, the businesses? Depends on the week. Okay. Depends on the day. It just yeah. flows. Um, with inside our, with inside our offices, it's yeah. it's kind of a circle. I have one door that goes out to the yoga side and one door that goes out to the music side. <laughs> That's how my day is, and it, it really it really depends. Most of my international travel is obviously music. Sure. Um, you know, I I work an eighty hour a week. Yeah. You know, I, I don't see it as work. Yeah. I'm doing something that I passionately love. Okay. So it's kind of, you take what comes at you. Yeah. And you know, the one thing I do do though is I take an hour to an hour and a half every day and I do yoga. Yeah. And it's for my sanity. But also, it's honestly, it's where I get the best ideas. Because a lot of the noise has been dissipated. It's, it's very hard to deal with drama or issues when you're balancing on on one foot with, with sweat dripping off you. Because yeah. if you think about other things, guess what's going to happen? You're going to fall. You're gonna fall. Yeah. That is embarrassing. A-type personalities do not like to be embarrassed. So we focus in, but you get amazing ideas when all of the clutter is like flushed out. So whether it's first thing in the morning or like a lunchtime, I can't do evenings now. Mm -hmm. But you know, those are amazing, amazing times. And it's amazing who you see in yoga now, too. Sure. It, it just shocks me. Yeah. Accountants, lawyers, you know, I, I, I never thought I'd see that. <laughs> it's, and Accountants. there's some people who I do business with who it takes me a minute to recognize them because it's out of context. Yeah. How many of you have been to a Y Yoga studio? Put up your hand. Not bad. Yeah. I, I encourage you to go. It's I tell you, there's millions of me. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. I, yoga. Music, family life. Family life. I, I'm in. I'm on my second family right yeah. now. Yeah. So yeah. the first one, um, I have a, a beautiful 11-year-old 11, 11 daughter and nine-year-old son. Yeah. Um, obviously, um, mostly done during the sort of music part of my career. Mm -hmm. um, when you're a high-powered artist manager, you travel and you're not around a lot. Yeah. So um, I made a decision three, four years ago that I, I didn't want to be that. I'd, I'd seen one sort of relationship dissolve, yeah. and I'm like, okay, um, I love music, but I don't necessarily have to deal with other people's dramas, sure. which is what artist managers do. They deal with other people's dramas. So I decided to focus purely upon the music part, yeah. so on the intellectual property part, and slowly but surely pulled myself out of, artist, out of the artist management company. I work with my artist managers, but I'm not day-to-day -day for any artist. Where at one point I was day-to-day -day for anyone from Avril Lavigne to Bare Naked Ladies to Coldplay to Dido to Sarah McLachlan, the list was long. Um, I didn't have a life, and that's why the first marriage mm -hmm. dis, you know, disintegrated. So this time around, um, 
I s still travel, mm -hmm. but I'm I'm home a lot. I'm, I'm home a lot more, and I'm and I'm dealing with my own life versus um, many other people's sure, lives. Sure, yeah, I can imagine. And it's 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 I, I think it's great training for being a I think a really understanding and compassionate and non judgeful parent yeah. is to ha is is to have dealt with all of those artists for decades because yeah. <laughs> you've I've seen everything. I'm not going to go into it, no matter how much I, I've question? seen no. everything. Um, you, we talked about the, the, the activities that you enjoy, uh, the home life, and I wanted to bring it back to work. The people you surround yourself with at work, the teams that you have yeah. in the different areas, um, how do you put those people together and how they've come together and how do you, how do you hire and how do you, how do you figure out who belongs where in your, in your organizations? You know, the, the, the HR component is, is always a work in progress. Yeah. Um, to have someone stay with you for 20, 30 years is a, is a rarity. Um, maybe at some point it's actually better that they, you know, leave because sure. they've done what they wanted to do there. They've, they've like learned that sort of work, that sort of work skills and they like move yeah. on. I think it's really, really key to have a good senior team. On the sort of music side, there's about 12 people who have been with the company on and off for the better part of 20 plus years. Mm -hmm. They're all music lovers. They all love the same type of music. They're all in different facets of the sort of business. And it's a really good team in the sense that if someone's bullshitting, they call bullshit. <coughs> That's really hard to do in a company, is to have that honesty. Yeah. It's the hardest thing to get. You get that with friends. You don't get that with people who work for you. So all of those people are partners with inside the company, mm -hmm. and they have a no problem phoning me up and going, are you crazy? Yeah. Um, on the you know, yoga side, with it, with it being such a, a, a young company, yeah. it's, you know, it's, you build the team a step at a time, and sure. and literally, along the way, you have to hire up. Of course. So you start with what you can afford, yeah. and you slowly but surely build it. And in key positions, you slowly but surely you, you like higher up. Yeah. And I think where Y Yoga sits right uh, right now, it's in a very good place for the next three four years, mm -hmm. to expand the way that we want to. It has the right team there, and they're they're building the right systems for it. Systems are really, really crucial, right? And it's something that I understand. It's not something that I want to have my fingers in. Yeah. But I understand the value of systems. Like, network has great systems. Sure. Why yoga, not so great systems yet, but they're yeah. getting better. Sure. And it's that skill set of people who are really passionate about systems. That's what their passion is, is, you know, they want systems that actually work and systems that can tell them something and systems that they can control the process. Because chances are most of your senior people are control freaks. So they want systems that they can control. So that's the stage that why yoga is at right now. As you build music, yoga, have you ever thought, is there a third, fourth, any no. other businesses? These are your two? I'm in the family business right that's now. That's cool. Okay. That's cool. the third business. Good answer. Good answer. I like that. <laughs> we got some. Uh, I, I'm going to ask one more question before we uh, break out to the group here. Um, when you were when you were envisioning yourself 20 years ago when the music business was starting, maybe 30 years ago now. 30. 30 years ago, did you ever imagine it to be like this? And would you have changed anything? I definitely didn't imagine that it would get to where it got to. Sure. Um, I could never have imagined that. Yeah. Frankly, I, I didn't know it existed. Um, I had no doubt that we'd be successful. Mm -hmm. To the extent that we've been successful, no. Um, to the extent that we're still successful, I mean, it's just, ne you know, Network's probably having one of its best years in two decades. Wow. So it's, and it's building a, a really cool company. Yeah. And, it's, and it's based on, on I, I kind of use a, a baseball analogy, it's based on base hits. All of the major labels, which are the big guys, they need home runs to support their sort of economic, you know, structure. We need base hits. And the great thing about base hits is if you if you get a double grade, if you get a triple grade, if you get a passenger and it's a grand it's a grand slam, it's it's stunning. My cost structure hasn't really gone up much. Maybe I'm spending more on marketing and promotion, but for every dollar that I spend, I'm making five. So it's very, very scalable there. But 
if that was just a base hit, I'd be perfectly happy uh, with that, because all we're doing is layering in value. And we're building this, li this library, which I can put on a thumb drive. And it might take 100 people 30 years to make this, but it'll take two or three people to run it if we decided to not build any more and just take what we've got and monetize that. So the, the multiples that you'll get on that are absolutely amazing. It's all digital. You need a couple of accountants to do the royalty statements. That's it. Ten years ago, I needed an army of people to run this. If I decide to no longer add anything new, network can go from 100 people down to two people and throw out millions and millions of dollars. It's, it's, that's what technology's done to the music business, at least to, to the model that we've actually built. But I have way too much fun yeah. signing artists I love yeah. and just layering on that value. Passion. The latter of my question, would you have done anything differently? I would have liked to have avoided the first 10 years of poverty. Sure. I mean, what's, what, is, what is like very interesting is um, early on in our you know, career, we had this, there was a, quite a, a well-publicized lo you know, lawsuit against, against, against Sarah by a, a producer who you know, said that um, she had ripped off some of his you know, music and that he'd been underpaid. We were able to put to the court that Mark and I, as, as owners of the company, for the first 10 years, we would have been better off not doing the company and being on the dole. We would have made more money from being on welfare than what we had the actual company. So completely undercutting their argument that they'd been underpaid because this certain person was paid the equivalent of six months of our salary for doing one month of work. And this is the owners of the like, company. So that argument went away quickly. So, but that was a, was like a whoa, because by that point we had become popular and that's why we were getting sued, right? You, Become, sex, you become successful and people sue you. So, um, you know, it was a real eye-opener to us for exactly what had happened that first decade. You know, how if it hadn't have been for the delivering of the pizzas or working at the nightclub or working at the record store or, you know, mom dropping off the big bags of white rice and, you know, and like the frozen vegetables, there's no way that we could have made it. It just wouldn't have happened. Thank you. I want to uh, take this opportunity first. Thank you, Terry, for that interactive and uh, really awesome discussion and dialogue. But I want to keep the dialogue going, and I want to include all of you in that. And I'm going to open up the floor to uh, some questions, and I'll field them, and uh, Terry will answer them. Please, Harash, yeah. Um, so about the, uh, the, the article you wrote. And about yeah. The, the, you mean the like, paper I wrote back in 2008? Yes. Yeah. Uh, why hasn't there been? more record labels like Network or, or the major labels that have invested or have actually been involved with music technology and, and music startups like the Spotify's or the Shazam's or you know so many of them that have done so well now. I think for the for the longest time the the keepers of the castle tried to keep the door locked and the molt full of you know water. Um, the problem is with tech Technology is it takes a round world and it flattens it, you know. Up to the 1600s, the world was flat and then it became round. Well, it's back to being flat again. So, and they didn't realize that technologies can hop borders. Like, it doesn't matter. You know, if it comes out of Sweden, it's going to be everywhere. So, they did not understand what this flat world was. They thought they could stop things like, you know, like they used to at like international borders based upon laws within, within inside those uh, countries. Well, it doesn't work that way. So it wasn't until about maybe three, four years ago when, you know, Spotify was really getting going that the major labels went, hang on, you're either going to write us a $10 million check, which was their typical line, to get our intellectual property. And by the way, that's just an access fee. So we're not going to pay that to the artists. That's just your access fee for having access to our like, catalog, which was a whole sham all in, its, all in itself. They went from that type of point of view to, OK, we want 40% of your company. Because without music, you don't have a company. And I think that's why, and that was a major turning point. Imagine if they had gotten 40% of, the, of like, the iPod sales. Your Apple stock wouldn't have peaked at $800. It would have peaked at like $300. 
and the major labels would all be very, very rich. And it would be a very different thing. So I think they learn from not getting it to understanding that if our content creates your model, rather than asking you for a big check, we'd rather just have some sort of equity. And so the major labels, I, I don't know what's happened through the dilution of multiple rounds of sort of raises, but initially they had 40% of Spotify. So if you're sitting there as an artist, you're going, okay, I'm not getting any of that. But without my intellectual property, you would never have gotten that. So that's a bit of a sort of gray area right now. But they have woken up, they are getting smarter, and they're not nearly as greedy. Yeah. Question. Neil? Um, I uh, am very passionate about small business, mm -hmm. entrepreneurship, and owning a small business, and I read a lot about marketing and, and all that. And you talked about systems. Yep. Could you maybe, maybe talk about that pertaining to your business or your experience? Yeah, sure. I mean, I read you know, the e myth, and I work in, um, in my family business. And, um, I've worked with like business consultants, and a lot of them say, they keep saying system, system, system. Systems to me are the ability to understand your business, the ability to see business that might be opportunities, or things that stick out that maybe are rather odd that maybe shouldn't stick out, which are early indicators of possible trends. Without really good systems to see that data, you're never going to see those, those sort of outliers. So for me, systems are, they accomplish two things. They spread information amongst the whole company. Information that, because um, information for everybody is a bit different. And you have to make it in such a way that different people can pull the same information, but for completely different uses. You know, whether a PR person's pulling it, or a radio person's pulling it, or a salesperson's pulling it. it. They might be pulling three different parts of that information. So your systems have to be able to um, give the information to your team that is valuable to your team to then talk about. And it's valuable to me where what I do is I, I look for small fires. And I don't care whether the fire starts in Toledo, Ohio, or Liver like Liverpool, England. I couldn't care less. I mean, passenger broke out at Amsterdam broke out of Amsterdam and it took 22 months to travel around the world and break everywhere. But it broke out of Amsterdam. Without that breaking out of Amsterdam, it would have been much harder getting that Super Bowl commercial. But if we didn't have systems, we would never have seen that. Because Holland is so small on the map of the music world. It's probably market number 50. It's almost non-existent. But it was very meaningful to be able to see that fire see that anomaly within what was happening. So systems have got to be able to give you that information. So it's, it's all about you having a checklist of what you need to see. And sometimes it can be quite frustrating getting those systems to work properly. But I mean, keep to it because it's, it's, it's your eyes into that grayness. Because you, be you can't be everywhere. So that data, that data's, Data is a perception, so you can perceive it in many different ways, which is, which, is, which is why systems to give you clean data without bias are, is really, really key, so that each, each part of the company can perceive that data differently. So I, I don't know whether I've really answered your you know, you know, question, but you should create a, a, sort of, uh, a sort of list of things that you need to know with inside your business for what you do and then see what your other senior people need to know, because it might not be what you need to know, but there, there will be some commonality. And then start building systems around the sort of common things first. Because data is, is, it's just information. And a lot of companies don't use it well. Or they try and ignore it if it doesn't tell them what they want to hear. When it's telling you what you don't want to hear, what a great opportunity. I love mistakes. I'll go back here and then I'll Sean right after. Yeah. yeah, you mentioned a couple of times that your initial passion was sort of identifying and connecting with the artists. Yep. Um, now, how has that changed over time with technology and the barriers to creating music and sharing music? They've been reduced. How do you sort of shift through 
the volume of music and find the artists, what are you looking for in that respect and how has that changed over time? Uh, Network's always been a, um, a record label based on singer-songwriter. The great thing about singer-songwriter is you can be a rock band or you can be a country artist or you can be a bluegrass artist or like a pop artist. As long as you um, write your own music, you produce your own music and you perform your own music, you kind of fit into the sort of um, bubble that, that you know, we like. Now, music is a personal choice. What my palette is might not be your palette. Um, but what I found is the stuff that I, that I absolutely love, turns out there's enough people that share my palette that if I'm really good at making them aware of it, I have a business model. So I don't look at stats. I mean, I, I, I love it now when like artists pitch you. They, they, they give you their Facebook likes, their Twitter followers, their, and if they're coming from Asia, you get their, their Weibo and their Yuku, and, and you get all these social stats. And they send you beautiful photos that they pay thousands of dollars for. I don't look at any of it. I, I, I find the link to the music, and I, hit, and I hit the button. It's on a separate screen, and I keep doing what I'm actually doing. I've got to hear, the music's got to, it has to have me, it has to get me. And it could be that it doesn't get me right, you know, uh, right away. It could be that I'm in the shower five days later and I'm humming something. That, this has happened to me so many times. I don't, I can't figure out what I'm actually humming. But it has subconsciously got me. And then I spend two or three days trying to figure out what the hell that song is. But I know when that happens, the song's a hit. It's got into my subconscious. It has emotionally created new networks within inside this brain. It has it emotionally impacted me in some way. I might not understand how yet, but it has. That's a hit. Awesome. Sean? Uh, you touched upon uh, gut feel, yeah. instinct, or? Intuition. Intuition in yeah. terms of picking artists. Yeah. In terms of business overall, but, you know, whether it's why you or your music business. How important, or could you expand on that? Uh, your your reliance on your own gut feeling yeah. instinct in terms of making decisions, and how important that has been to your success. I I love the term gut instinct or or gut feeling because part of your brain actually sits right sits right here. That's the actual physical scientific part. Part of your brain sits uh, sits uh, sits right here. It's your intuition, I found for me, is 100 is 100 is 100 percent right. I find the logical mind fights my intuition constantly. It's it's this battle royal going on constantly. Logic says something different than what intuition says. Logic is usually the easy, organized, easy to process way. Intuition is the shit disturber. It's and you don't. All, you don't necessarily understand why. And that's, for most people, that's a problem. For entrepreneurs, that's a bit of reassurance. It's actually the opposite. So um, whenever I've gone against my intuition, it's never worked. It's really interesting. It's never worked. I can't think of one time that I've gone with my intuition fully that it hasn't worked. Now, you know, working is, can be a scale of 1 to 10. You know, it, it doesn't need to be a 10. You know, um, abundance is not all about money. Abundance is, is how you feel. You feel happy that you did that? Or do you feel happy that you screwed someone and made it an extra 100 grand? The first one is where I'll go. The second one will catch up with me later. I very much believe in karma. Okay. I mean, the great thing about network and about why yoga is we have a great reputation because we're honest. And it's a golden handshake. If we a, agree on something, we'll basically stick to it. And in, a, you know, and in the music business, believe me, that is rare. So usually till it's signed with an 80-page with an contract behind it that, that like litigators love, nothing solid. Go to Arvind, and then we'll go to you after right after. Please go ahead. Um, Terry, you spoke about two things. One is passion, and of course, systems, right? Yeah. So there seems to be a, dichot a dichotomy between mm -hmm. the two because obviously, like you said, like you know, you struggle and you couldn't make enough money. So if, if had, there had been systems and you had like done measurement, right? You're not getting the revenue, and that's like you know, mm -hmm. so you wouldn't have. So the systems came in later at a yeah. stage, right? 
and you always followed your heart. It's more about the passion and systems follow on rather than the other way around. Otherwise, you wouldn't have continued, you know, with your businesses. Well, the great thing about the music business when I first came into it, they didn't have systems. It was all it was all smoke and mirrors. Yeah. It was incredible when when SoundScan came in, which was the ability to scan a bar a barcode and have it count as one. This little country artist that had never been heard of, wasn't even on the top 200 sellers, became the number one artist in America. That artist's name, Garth Brooks. When all the smoke and mirrors went, and they actually went on data, this country artist was the number one selling artist in America. Overnight, the business was stunned. So luckily, when I started, there were no systems. So even if, you know, what was great about network is I, I, I used to run Excel spreadsheets, and I'd pull data from three, four different places and put it into this spreadsheet and see what actually correlated. So we would take a national marketing budget and we'd micro-market it uh, at a regional level. So rather than taking all of our light money across 100 cities, we'd take all of that money, because we didn't have a lot, and we'd put it on one city. On one city where that data said that we had a heartbeat. And we'd blow that city up. The artists would go there three, four times within one year. But every time that they went, the crowds were bigger and bigger and bigger. Then we did the next city. The artists used to think that I put on a blindfold, I had a map of America, and I threw darts at it. <laughs> and that's where they went. Because nothing ever made sense to them as the rooting was illogical. But the data that supported where they went wasn't. And as long as there was more people there than like the last time, and I'm not talking 14 people to 15 people, I'm talking 100 people to 300 people to 800 people to 1,500 people. If the artists saw that, they would keep going because they knew in their heart it was working. So it, it, it was kind of interesting is that data in the music business in the 80s and 90s, no one knew how to use it. There were no systems or the systems that were there we're completely not, you know, we all know how software programs don't necessarily talk with each other. That's kind of what it was. So we take the raw data, throw, just throw it into our own programs, and it would show us what's up. And then I put on my blindfold and throw the darts against, against the apple. <laughs> right here. So, yeah. so you, you mentioned uh, the logic of working against the audience. Think. So you, are you saying you, you're not quite that uh, detailed person? I can deep dive into detail um, if I believe that there's something interesting in there that's, that's got my curiosity ramped up. I'm a, I'm a very curious person. I mean, the name Y Yoga is act, actually came from the thought of W-H-Y Yoga. I just deleted the W-H and put it there. It all came because I was stuck in a, about a 40 minute traffic jam in London. You know, and have you ever been in London? I, I was there last week. I got caught in a three hour traffic jam. I was in a cab for three hours. What do you do? You, you, you like think about things. Or you can get really frustrated and pissed off. I you know, chose to actually think about things. So I, I love asking why. And when people say it can't be done, what a great answer. Because yeah. you know it can be. Great. You know they've created the self-limitation due to their, to their like, logic. We were, we were the first company to take a CD and actually put other media on it. And everyone said it couldn't be done. I was like, OK, I get my software programs on one type of CD. I get my music on another. And you're telling me I can't, com I can't combine these. And I can still remember the, the little QuickTime video was about that big. <laughs> and I showed it to um, a, very, a very famous music man, Clive Davis. He said, he looked and went, that will never work. YouTube is yeah. the biggest radio station in the world. Yeah. <coughs> but that's, if you can't see it because you're locked into a certain way of logic, then any blue sky you, you have becomes gray. So logic's great when you're looking at data. Uh, I wonder of why you got to educate either the government or companies to you know, be more preventive rather than being, you know, giving a cure to an already injured body. Well, I, you know what, the, the, the amazing thing about yoga is to create an experience. Because everyone's going to experience it differently. It's kind of like music. You can have the same song, it's experienced differently, emotionally. So 
my thought behind the, the whole yoga was to simplify as best that I could, but make the experience to the point where I would take away every reason why you wouldn't do it. But anyone's path in, uh, into yoga and through yoga has got to be their own path. So we stripped out the you know, spirituality, made it really, really simple, um, made it so that you could understand it. You know, I mean, still if I say hatha to people, they, they don't understand what that is. And it, it, it's kind of, we tried to really simplify it to make it not scary and easy to get into, knowing that the more that you practice it, the physical aspect is interdependent to the spiritual aspect. You will find your own spirituality. You'll find your own meditation. All yoga is, is a moving meditation. When you get to that point where it really begins to affect you, it's a moving meditation. Till then, it's an amazing detox. The most profound thing for me was um, getting the, the postcard from my chiropractor asking where I'd been for the past six months, <laughs> and the realization that I was no longer in pain. That was a huge aha moment for me. And I don't know too many people that don't have lower back pain when they get into their 40s. Okay? Um, I'm not saying that yoga is going to cure it, but it sure cured it for me. And, and every, every, everybody's going to have their own, their own path. So it's understanding that and creating an experience that allows you to be comfortable. Follow your own path. You know, there's a, another accounting firm not like this one that's looking at putting a Y Yoga in one of their buildings because the head of HR has fallen in love with the benefits of yoga and understands how their workforce could benefit from that and how it's a competitive edge over their competitors and has sold that with inside that company to the point that it might actually come to fruition. So if I go talk to businesses, it's in one ear, out the other. If you experience it personally and it affects you, I don't know anybody in this room who doesn't want to share things with their friends and their peers that makes their life better. That's the glue. So view it as, um, View it as a raindrop that doesn't go like this, it goes like this. So my thing is to make it really comfortable for people like me to experience what we do at Y Yoga and know it'll have a profound effect as that ripple goes out. Doing it the other way, never work. Never work. Um, question here and then question in the back. Question here, go ahead. So Terry, you did the two years at UBC? Four. Four years. Yeah. How much of that education do you use or how much of it has it influenced the way you look at businesses or the way you look at reconstructing or, or improving things once you've started them? Um, I think the, the great thing about, about engineering is it teaches you a way to think. Um, it also destroys your ability to write because they want you to print everything because they don't want bridges to fall, to fall, to fall down. So it deconstructed my ability to write. So I'm hoping with my daughter I will learn how to write again. But it teaches you to think a certain way. And it teaches you to look at, at data with, without biases. And when I came to the music business, I couldn't understand all of the smoke and mirrors. It was all hype. None of it was real. And so, you know, I, I think that was a great basis to have is I understood how to create a spreadsheet and how to look at data and how to correlate it and how to see things that maybe didn't quite fit with the rest of the pack. And those are the things that interest me. As an, if, I, if I was an engineer, those are the things that interest me because those could be new ways of doing things or really big problems. So you, you tended not to look at what was sitting in the middle. You tend to look at what was on the edges because those were either issues or, or opportunities. So I think that way of thinking was, was great. And that, that, that basis in you know, math was great. And not being, a, not being a, a afraid of technology, I mean, I had to write a pro, uh, program on punch, on like punch cards. You know how frustrating you know, that is? You know, it, it, that's how we wrote the initial software, was on punch cards. So technology didn't scare me. I mean, the first thing we had in our, 
in our office was a fax machine. And everyone looked at this thing like, like, what is this? Like, how does this work? You know, and then the next thing was to get a photocopier to photocopy the faxes because the paper back then was the, uh, was, was the thermal paper. And three, four days later, the print would start to, to do a Harry, a, a Harry Potter and disappear. But I mean, it, it's, it's, it taught me not to be afraid of technology and to use data. So without that, I, I don't know whether it, it would have worked, to be honest with you. I have uh, last three questions, one in the back here, here, and then last year. Please go ahead, yeah. Um, obviously, your experience mirrors mine for seeing different countries adopt things like music streaming um, mm -hmm. a lot more rapidly than North America. Yep. Um, and even in the U.S., we see um, less regulatory content laws uh, than perhaps in Canada. Canada yep. seems to be one of the countries where content is most restricted as far as don't get me going on Canada. <laughs> Canada's gen, uh, gen, uh, is generational. Till that generation retires or dies off, we're going to be back in the 1800s. Probably eight, nine years ago, I did a talk at, at you know, Canadian Music Week where I did a keynote. And my poor partners back in Vancouver had to hear about that keynote <laughs> for the next six months. People that were royally very upset about everything I had to say. Um, one of those people recently retired, which is why we might see Spotify by the end of the year. People were married to a certain way of looking at things, and I, and I respect that. The problem is the generation that is consuming the content doesn't share the same perspective. Every, pers every perspective's correct, and I'm not gonna judge it, but one person's perspective has delayed that technology coming in to what is a very controlled country for the better part of eight, nine years. Right here. Thank you, Gary. Uh, in both your awesome entrepreneurial journeys, you were entering markets which were already occupied <coughs> by other larger players than yourself. Yep. And uh, you went through your own cycle to bootstrap and grow it. So what did you do to differentiate that, that led to your success? Clearly, a lot of the things that you talked about intuition and logic it's not played a role, but for the benefit of this audience, it'll help to, uh, to clarify how to differentiate because that's, that's what ultimately leads to the break. Right? Well, it's, I think that's where the selfishness really comes to bear. Like, really comes to bear. Like, what type of music do I like? Um, when it started, I didn't like the music that was on radio. I had nothing against Brian Adams or, or like Anne Murray, but hearing it over and over again was not my... It just wasn't my type of tea. It just, it just wasn't. Um, so I loved a certain type of music that wasn't commercial. And I was told it would never be commercial. You know, but one after another, all of those artists that were alternative became mainstream commercial successes. It's not that they moved to the mainstream. Mainstream moved to them based on, on generational consumption habits. Teenagers will never like what their parents like. They might like what their grandparents like, because the grandparents are a lot nicer to the like kids. Yes. That's that's what it is. Um, with why yoga, it was again, it was purely selfish. But I knew that if I built something for me, there's millions of people like me. There is, who could benefit from doing this, but won't go because of all of the barriers that are that are there. I mean, I can remember going to, to LA and asking where the changing room was and, and the girl behind the desk said, the closet there. And she wasn't kidding, it was a closet. And this was one of the most popular yoga studios in LA. I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it. I'm, I would never be a member there. I'd never go back there. So I'm well off, I want to do this, I'm willing to pay for an experience that, res that resonates with, uh, uh, with me. That's the opportunity, but what I needed to do was to make a checklist on what was important to me. And funny enough, it wasn't the same checklist as what, as, as you know, uh, Lara uh, Kozan, who I you know, founded Why Yoga With, her checklist was very different. A yoga teacher has a completely different yeah. perspective. Yeah. And that's why a lot of yoga studios don't become successful. Because their mom and pop operation started by a yoga teacher who wants to share their love and passion for the lineage of yoga that they just learned. I get that and I respect that, but that really narrows the possibility of what it can be. 
you know, why yoga started off teaching, and still does, about 12 different lineages. I don't know anybody that does that, except a lot have now followed. We had infrared saunas. Now everyone seems to want to have an infrared sauna. We had a whole pile of things that were all about me that now seem to be about everyone else. <laughs> why? Because I'm like everybody else. I'm no different. I'm not above, below. I'm just the same. And it's all interdependent. I can't emphasize that more. So as an entrepreneur, be completely selfish. And I'm not talking about keeping the money and all that stuff. It's not where I'm going here. Build something that you love, that you can give that 80 hours a week to, that is not work when it's midnight on a Sunday and you're still doing it. OK? If it's work, then you're doing the wrong thing as an entrepreneur because you should be doing something you love. And if you keep to that selfishness, you'll do well. Yeah. You can look at that little fair app, download it, and it's as good as any of the see today. Can you explain what your role is to see the role of that? Interesting. Um, for one, an, an app should be simple. There's some things I, about the Y Yoga app that I love, and there's some things that I don't love. Um, the Lilith app was a real simple app. wasn't trying to be anything more than what it was, but first in class at what it, at like what it was. What I love about apps is that people share them. And that's great. So if you create a great app, it gets shared. And it's usually a peer-to-peer -peer recommendation that, act, that actually does that. And um, I think, you know how I went back to the word simple? If I can make it simple for you to buy a, a, a five a five card pass, the next time you might buy a month to month because it was really easy and you loved the experience. If I put things in the way and hurdles that you have to jump to use that, those are all barriers. That's all Velcro, I call it. It's all hassle. So um, apps for me should be really simple. Um, they should be logical. And you can have emotive parts in it. But I think the, the motive part of an app should be in what that person pulls from it um, in, the, in like the actual content, not in the functionality of it. It should be really easy. And guess what? You should make it for a mobile device. <laughs> yeah. Now, the funny thing is, in the case of Y Yoga, we still find the majority of our users are iPhone users. Really interesting. You know, uh, the, the androids haven't gotten into the yoga world yet. They will, you know. But it, it's, just, it's just, for me, apps are, you know, they're just logical. I mean, it, it's, it's, Network had a bulletin board. It's like, anybody know what a bulletin board is? A bulletin board was before the World Wide Web. It's where you'd go post something, and maybe someone would comment to it. This was... Like, I can't remember when this was, maybe 15, 20, uh, 20 years ago. So technology to me, if it makes my life easier, great. We created a bulletin board for fans, depending upon where they were, to make a comment about something. Usually it wasn't a comment that you wanted to hear, but still, I mean, you could, you could see where the comment came from, and that was valuable, even if you didn't like what they had to say. It means that your music got to wherever they were. So you, you, you just learn something, right? But um, apps and technology and anything that you do should be used in a way to make life simpler. And that's why I, I said probably the hardest thing for, for me and my challenge is to get too simple. If I can build a Y yoga that's really simple or systems that are really simple, I think that's a huge win. It's a huge win. Wonderful. There's, um you know, first of all, I've learned so much today, and I have to, I have to say, somebody who started a business 30 years ago, um, uh, some, some, some businesses and some concepts and some ideals might be outdated. Uh, to continue that business and to see success in it is one thing. And uh, in a business like music, it makes people happy. It's, there's, 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 a lot of, uh, there's a lot of people that are affected by it. The second business, yoga, which is, um, Transcendent from from generations of people who have been in exercising for, um, you know, from my mother country, from India, and mm -hmm. I I look at I look at how it's brought into North American culture, and it's been widely accepted, and 
you've done both right. You've done, and, and you're still, and you're still trying to finesse and, and keep. I think that's a perspective. Out. It's because, my perspective because some people would say that I've done it wrong. Interesting. And I respect that. From yeah. my perspective, I'm I'm happy. But what's so cool is that he gets that too. That you see that side, and and I think it's it's so interesting that uh, you share things with passion and happiness and. Uh, it's, it's brought a lot of knowledge and interesting thoughts in my own mind. Um, I'd like to thank you, ladies and gentlemen, Terry McBride.